أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لم تقولون ما لا تفعلون كبر مقتا عند الله أن تقولوا ما لا تفعلون إن الله يحب الذين يقاتلون في سبيله صفا كأنهم كأنهم بنيان مرصوص وإذ قال موسى لقومه يا قوم لم تؤذونني وقد تعلمون أني رسول الله إليكم فلما زاغوا أزاغ الله قلوبهم والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين وإذ قال عيسى بن مريم يا بني إسرائيل إني رسول الله إليكم فلما جاء صدقا لما بين يدي من التوراة ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعد اسمه أحمد فلما جاءهم بالبينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين فمن أظلم ممن افترى على الله الكذب وهو يدعى إلى الإسلام والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين ومن أظلم ممن افترى على الله الكذب وهو يدعى إلى الإسلام والله لا, ي... والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون والذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون صدق الله العظيم Dear brothers and sisters, uh, believe me, I'm equally a guest like yourselves in this historic meeting, this being the first visit of Brother Ahmad Idad to Geneva. Three days ago, I received by post and an invitation. No wonder. The hall is not full. It should have been more than full, but many do not know what Brother Ahmad that is in Geneva. The brother is Islam and Christianity. Brother Ahmad that I think most of you have known of him, about him, an outstanding scholar, both in Quran and in the Bible of international standing. We would have liked very much this occasion to be in the shape of a dialogue for the sense of fairness that should have perfected the occasion. But our good hearted brothers tried their best to organize this meeting and give it to understand, tried, but the offer was declined. So we shall have the pleasure of listening to Brother Ahmed Idat for 45 minutes, one hour, less more. It all depends on the spiritual report to you and him, 
and after that there will be enough occasion for questions and answers pertaining to the subject. الحمد لله بعده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مفتح الأبواب ويا مسبب الأسباب ويا دليل الحائرين توقلت عليك يا رب العالمين وأفوض أمري لله إن الله بصير بالعباد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله إن الدين إن الله الإسلام صدق الله صدق الله العظيم. Mr. Chairman and brethren, the subject as has been advertised for this evening's discussion is Christianity and Islam. I think we would rather have it as Judaism, Christianity and Islam because there is a definite affinity between these three great Semitic faiths. See, the religions of the world can easily be divided into two major groups. One group of religions called the Aryan religions and the other group of religions, the Semitic religions. Among the Aryan religions, I would consider Hinduism, Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. This is of the Aryan group. The Semitic, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. The unity of these three faiths consists in the unity of God. You see, in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, May the peace of God be upon them all. There is not an iota of difference. I said in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. I didn't say in the teachings of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Mark my words. Now in the fundamentals of the teachings of these prophets, I said there is not an iota of difference. Between the religious groupings, there are many differences. When I say there is no difference in the fundamentals, I mean like, for example, the first commandment. The very first commandment as given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses was in the Hebrew language, Shama Israel Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The first commandment. Some 1350 years after Moses, a learned man of the Jews called a scribe in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, this learned man of the Jews comes to Jesus and questions him. He said, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, Maulana, learned man, Sheikh, Master, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him, in the Hebrew language, Shama Israelu Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. He repeated word for word what was given by Moses 1300 years before without the change of a dot. That in the fundamentals of religion, in the fundamentals of belief or faith, there is no change. He confirms the very words given by Moses. Some 600 years after Jesus, a Christian deputation comes to the Holy Prophet Muhammad in Medina. And they were having a dialogue for three days and three nights in the Masjid al Nabawi, the Mosque of the Prophet. This Mosque of the Prophet is in no way to be compared to our Islamic center, the Mosque, the beautiful Mosque here in Geneva. This must have been mud walls, thatch roof, and plastered with mud on the floor, maybe with grass mat or palm leaf fiber mat. 
This Christian deputation was accommodated in the mosque. They slept in the mosque, they ate in the mosque, they discussed in the mosque for three days and three nights. During the course of this discussion, this dialogue, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question. He said, all right, all right, now tell us, O Muhammad, among so many other things, says, tell us now, what is your concept of God? And the Holy Prophet Muhammad is made to say, Qul huwallahu ahad, say, he is God, the one and only. He said, ahad, one and only. Jesus said, ikhad, meaning one and only. Moses said, ikhad, meaning one and only. What is the difference? It's the same word meaning the same thing. Ahad and ikhad, ahad in Hebrew, yeah, in Arabic means one. Ikhad in Hebrew means one. And the difference between these two words is only the pronunciation. If I, if the blackboard was any nearer, if I had uh, foresight, I would have told them to bring the blackboard nearer. I don't want it now. And if I had a chalk, I would write ahad. Alif, ha, da. Ahad in Arabic, meaning one and only. And to make it ikhad, I, on the ha, I put a dot. That becomes ha. Ha becomes ha just by putting a dot. That is in the writing, calibrating. But as far as the meaning is concerned, the word is concerned, it means one and the same thing. That God Almighty is the one and only being that there is. So, my statement, that in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, there is not an iota of difference. And according to the Muslim belief, there is no such thing as Judaism, Christianity and Islam. It is only Islam. In the verse I read to you from the Holy Quran, God Almighty says, in dina in the Allah islam So most certainly the religion that is acceptable in the sight of God is Islam. Then what about Judaism? What about Christianity? Don't they exist? Are there no such faiths as Judaism and Christianity? I said yes, not by name. These names didn't exist. You see, this word Judaism, where does it come from? You ask the Jew, the learned man of the Jew, ask him, where does this word Judaism originate? Is it in your Bible, the Bible of the Jews, the Old Testament, the Old Testament, in this Christian Bible called the Holy Bible, is divided into two parts called the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. Now, in this Old Testament, there are the first five books of this Old Testament called Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these are supposed to be the Torah. We say Torah. The Jew says Torah. Torah means the law. These five, first five books. This is the fundamental, the basis of the teachings of Moses. Torah, Torah. Is this word Judaism to be found in the Torah? He says, no, it's not there. Is it in the Talmud? He says, no, it's not there. Is it in the Mithna? He says, no, it's not there. Then where did you get it? Where did you get this term Judaism from? Did Moses hear this word Judaism? He says, no, he never heard the term Judaism. If Moses was alive today, if we can meet him personally, maybe in the hereafter, and if he had the opportunity of questioning him, he said, oh Moses, tell us, what, is, what was your religion? What is the name of your religion that you are teaching? I do not expect him to say Judaism. Because the poor man, he never heard the word. He never heard the word Judaism in his life. What do I expect him to say is, that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. A beautiful description. A lengthy description for the religion which he taught. Now one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. He is giving a description. A religion of total submission to God's will. We say that word, one word for that in Arabic is Islam. Judaism comes from the word Judah. Judah, one of the sons of Jacob. Israel, Yaqub, Yaqub alayhi salam. He had 12 sons, and Judah was the eldest of them, I take it. Now, 
when the Jews or the Bani Israel, the Israelites, when they conquered Palestine, Palestine was divided among the tribes. There were 12 tribes and each tribe was apportioned certain portion of land in Palestine. That portion of land occupied, occupied by the children of Judah was called Judea. And the people outside, they said that the religion followed by the children of Judah in Judea is Judaism. That's how this word Judaism came about. It's not in the Torah, it's not in the Talmud, it's not in the Mishnah. This is an invented word, concocted word. They concocted it and they liked the term and they adopted it. Judaism. But poor Moses, he never heard about Judaism. What about Christianity? If he had an opportunity in his second coming, Jesus Christ, if you have a chance of asking him, said, all right, oh Jesus, what is your religion? I do not expect him to say Christianity, because he also never heard the term. Believe me, in his lifetime he never heard the word Christianity. He never heard the word Christ. In his lifetime he never heard those terms. If he said Christianity, we have a right to ask him, what church do you belong to, sir? What church? Are you an Anglican or a Roman Catholic or a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Jehovah's Witness or a Seventh-day Adventist or a Mormon? What are you? What church? You'll agree it's ridiculous to ask Jesus what church he belongs to. What do you expect him to say? We expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. And one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. That's all. His religion was Islam. The religion of Moses was Islam and Moses was a Muslim. The religion of Jesus was Islam and Jesus was a Muslim. Does that mean he was following Muhammad? No. A Muslim means one who submits to the will of God. Abraham was a Muslim. David was a Muslim. Solomon was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. Muhammad was a Muslim. Anyone who submits to the will of God is a Muslim. The whole of nature is Muslim. They all submit to God's will. Man, often, of course, he goes against the will of God and he is not submissive. He says, I'm an atheist. He says, I'm an agnostic. He says many things about himself. See, but nature, everything in nature, the sun, the moon, the stars, the, the plants, the planets, everything submits. And as such, in Islam, they are all Muslims. They bow to God's will. Man is the only exception. He rebels. So the religion, how about the, where does the word Christianity come from? Is it in the Bible, Holy Bible of the Christian church? It's not there. The word Christianity is not there. But there is the word Christian. It does occur. It occurs in the New Testament. At Antioch, at Antioch, the enemies of the followers of Jesus, disparagingly they pointed to them, telling that these are Christians, implying that these are the worshippers of Christ. So they were called by the enemies, Christians. Jesus didn't say, I'm a Christian. He didn't tell his disciples, you are Christians. No, he's the enemy saying that these are Christians, worshippers of Christ. Like Buddhists. You know, all these are invented terms. Buddhism. Did Buddha say my religion is Buddhism? No. Did Christ say Christianity or Christianism? No. Did Moses say Judaism? No. These are people applying labels from the outside. And sometimes people love these imitation labels, you know, concocted labels. You see, in my country, I come from South Africa. In my country, we have been divided into races. It's a land of apartheid. Apart means keeping apart. Hate, the Afrikaans word apartheid means the philosophy of keeping people apart. So in keeping us apart, naturally it creates prejudices. So the white man calls the black man, everybody who is not a European is black. No matter how white he looks, he's black in my country. If you don't originate from Europe, you are black. No matter how white you look. Like me, when I go to some of the African countries, they treat me as a white man. 
and I get rough treatment. I said, look, I am the black man you are fighting for, man, you fool. You know, the, it is me who is, be, I am being persecuted, and you also kick me in the face. What's wrong with you? Can't you see? I am the black man. I said, no, you're not black. I said, I am black. My children are lighter complexion than me, but they are black. No matter how white you look, you are black. If you don't, you originate in Europe. So they divided the communities. Among the whites, there is a big division. But for the purpose of convenience, they are united in ruling the black man. Among the whites, there are the Afrikaners who are ruling at the moment. By force of numbers, they are in power. The English-speaking people, they were ruling for a long time, until 1910, I think. The union took place, and they started ruling together, and the English people were ruling, and somehow, around 1948 or somewhere, that the Africana nation, you know, they came to the top by force of numbers, they got into power, and there's no, other, no power on earth can move them now, unless there is a revolution. See, the English and the Germans and the French all put together can do nothing because the Africanas will predominate it by numbers. So among the whites, the Africana calls the Englishman Ruinek. Ruinek in his language means rednecks. Rednecks because he says that this guy is a softy. You know, he goes in the sun for a little while, he gets red in the neck. You know, softy, effeminate fellow. Who, the Englishman. And the Englishman calls the African a Bura. Bura means farmer. But when he says Bura, he means backward. Rustic. He doesn't mean a Bura literally means a farmer. And he's proud to say I'm a farmer. But when an Englishman calls him a Bura, it means you backward rustic fellow. Yeah? So the Englishman calls him Bura, and this guy calls him Ruinet. Then they call me, my people, they call us coolies. Coolies. Because some of our people went to labor in, in South Africa to cut sugar cane, so they said they went as indentured laborers. They saw every Indian a coolie. Coolie means a laborer. Then there is a colored community. There's a mixture between white and black. There are about three million. The white man created them. When he went to South Africa, that part of the world, he didn't take his wives along with him, so he got stuck into the Bushman woman and the Hot and Hot woman and the Bantu woman, and he created a mixed breed of people. Three million today, his children but they are all rejected. The white man rejects them all. He calls them hot knots, means hot and tops, or bushmen. They are the coloreds in my country. Coloreds means mixed breed. But when he talks about them, he calls them bushmen, hot and tot, hot knots. And the African, the sons of the soil, he is called Kaffir. Now mind what church he goes to. He is a Kaffir. So these are labels applied by the enemies one to another. I know Indian. I don't go around boasting I'm a coolie. Nobody does that. The Englishman doesn't go around boasting I'm a ruine. The African doesn't go around boasting I'm a Buddha. The colored doesn't go around boasting I'm a hot knot. Hot and hot. No, he doesn't. He's the outsider, the enemy is pointing, disparaging them, calling such names. But the Christians loved the term, so they adopted it. It's a term invented by the enemies. They say Christian, you worship as a Christ. Buddhist, worship as a Buddha. Buddhists, and they call us Mohammedans. You know that? They call us Mohammedans. They say that we are the worshippers of Muhammad. No, there is no such creature on earth. They don't know that. We didn't correct them. So Mohammedans. They have been calling us Mohammedans. Worshippers of Buddha are Buddhists. Worshippers of Christ are Christians. Worshippers of Muhammad are Mohammedans. But there is no such creature. There is no worshipper of Muhammad. We are a thousand million Muslims in the world today. Worshippers of God, God Almighty. Muhammad is a messenger, a prophet. He is no God. But this is the Westerners' way of labeling people. We worship Christ, so we are Christian. That guy worships Buddha, so he's a Buddhist. So these guys must be worshiping Muhammad, so call him Muhammad. But this is how the word Christian came about in the book, and Christianity around, around the world. And where did the word Christian come from? It comes from the word Christ. Where did the word Christ come from? It came from the word Messiah. Messiah. Arabic, Masih, which means anointed. I will be dealing with that aspect tomorrow. About Christ and Islam, I will deal with that. But now what we see is that in the teachings of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, there is not an, in the fundamentals, not an iota of difference. They all came from the same God, preaching the same religion. 
each according to the time, age, according to the needs of the people. This is the religion of God. According to the needs of the people, God Almighty gives people guidance. The Jews, the children of Israel, they came out of the Egyptian bondage. They moved into the Sinai Peninsula, moving from oasis to oasis. A nomadic people, 40 years in the desert, they needed a law that will give them quick justice, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Beautiful law. Beautiful law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I damage your eye, you damage mine. I broke your tooth, you break mine. Move on, there's work to be done. There's no time for lengthy litigations. There's no time for putting, putting a man in prison. It was more merciful to get rid of an adulterer and the adulteress by stoning them to death than to leave them in the desert to die of hunger and thirst. It was more merciful. And they become an object lesson for others. Says, Don't you do that. See what happens? What about that? Do you like to go through that? He said, no, not for me. He said, look, our system allows. If one woman is not enough, he says, get another. If two are not enough, get four. If four are not enough, get 40. Solomon had a thousand wives and concubines. One thousand. Look, if your system allows you a thousand wives and concubines, why interfere with somebody else's property? You are an antisocial character. You deserve death. Beautiful law. Beautiful law. For a nomadic people. But laws have a tendency to change characters of people over a period of time. Any law, every law. And you see examples of that. Hitler at Germany. We learn, they tell us, that six million Jews were incinerated. True or false? Whether it was six million, or six hundred thousand, or six thousand, I say it's dramatic enough. And one of the most cultured nations in Europe, the land of Goethe and Beethoven. Can you imagine them incinerating human beings? Six million Jews, if it is true. Six million Jews. Could they have done it? Yes. How is it possible? Programming, brainwashing. We all can be brainwashed into anything. Over a period, he says, these are parasites. Christ killers. They killed our Lord Jesus. Christ killers. Kill them, the swine, so they burned their homes, they raped their women and killed the Jews, and they ran and they fled from one country to another in Poland, in France, in Germany, in England, every European nation at Easter time they were persecuted and killing the Jews. And they ran to Muslim lands, seeking refuge. And the Muslims accepted them with open arms. Ahlan was Ahlan, says the Arab. Family and plain. Come, that's thing, you are a member of the family and be at ease. And they went and lived among the Arabs. Thousand years, running from country to country, Christian nations go to the Muslim land, the Muslim accepts them with open arms. But talking, but coming back, laws. See, in this law here, in Germany, program, people program, destroy the Jews, and they did it. In South Africa, my country, we are a color conscious country. Everything is based on color. That we also, everybody becomes color conscious. You know, I feel that I'm a little lighter than the other fellow, so I'm a little more superior than him. Everybody feels on the grounds of his complexion, he's superior to the other guy. When I'm looking for a daughter-in-law, I look for a daughter-in-law with the lightest complexion. We all suffer from inferiority complexes, cultivated over a period. Color, color, color. The Indian is made to feel is better than the African. The colored is made to feel he's better than the Indian. And the white man feels he's supreme. He's better than them all. This is it. It's cultivated. See, each and everyone feels also that way. I'm better than the other because I'm lighter than him. So, in that country, it has been my hobby talking to people. I talk to people. I love to talk about God, about religion. I like to share. And not only sharing my thoughts, I like to share the food that I eat. And I have invited Indians, Africans, colors, whites from my home, priests, businessmen, ordinary men, invite them. I have invited dozens of white people to my home, men and women, for meals and a chat. They enjoy my chat and they enjoy my food. Our food is 
exotic. You know, the Pakistani food, I don't know if you have tasted it. If you haven't, you must try. Our samosas, a lot of people don't know what a samosa is. Somebody, I think from Jiddai, he, he wrote to me, he says, look, man, on one of your talks, you know, you're talking about samosas. What is this samosa? You know? I said, look, when I come, I'll ask some Pakistani fellow to make some and <laughs> he make you to eat it, to taste it, what it is. Exotic, exotic food. You know, the, the other Indians, the other Indians meaning those who are Hindu, Tamils, Hindustanis, Telugus, they enjoy our food. The African enjoys our food. The white man enjoys our food. So they enjoy my talk and they enjoy my food. And they thank me profusely when they go. But no white man has ever called me to his house for a cup of tea in 40 years. Why? I ask them sometimes, point blank. I say, you people, don't you know how to reciprocate in your community? Do you ever reciprocate? Of course you do. Then how is it that nobody, no white man has ever called me to his house for a cup of tea? They meet me in the street subsequently, he says, you know, how's the missus? It's very fun, convey my regards for her. And you know, how grateful he is for the lovely million. But he doesn't say, what about coming and having a cup of tea with me? Bring the family down. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do that. Why not? The reason is that in the back of his mind, he's thinking of me as a man of color. I'm an Indian. I'm an inferior person. If I ever went to his home with my family, you know, with our attire, the long trousers and the downy, you know, the attire, the long dress and all that, and me with my funny headgear and my beard, I'm going and knocking at number 10 Downing Street, and there are people watering the garden, and the lady of the house, she opens the door, and she recognizes me, oh, hello, Mr. d -Dad. come in, come in. And people are watching, so look at her, you know how she welcomes this coolie, you know. And I go inside, and we sit down, and we have a chat. Five minutes goes this to half an hour, an hour. So what's going on inside there? Is this Mr. Smith running a shibin, you know, brothel or something, you know, selling liquor, illicit liquor, what? What's going on? So at the back of the mind, they're terrified. They have that feeling that they must reciprocate, but what will people say? And if I happen to be there, if the man's brother-in-law comes along, he'll have to apologize for my presence. So, you know, this is Mr. D-Dad. You know, we went to his home, and him and his family, they gave us a wonderful time. All that he has to do, in other words, to excuse the reason for why me being there. I'm not supposed to be there. But if it's another white man, that is Mr. Brown, hello, hello. So, this is Mr. White, hello, hello, so. But me, he has to explain why D-Dad is there. What does it? Program. It's a color conscious, even the priests, ministers, everybody is the same. Program. We all get programmed, brainwashed into different attitudes. Laws have a tendency to change characters of people over a period of time. You have harsh laws, stern laws, over a period of people also become hard and stern. Unforgiving. So between Moses and Jesus, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the Jews had become hard-hearted. They had forgotten forgiveness. So they went for the letter of the law. A man was trying to chase the birds from the field with that old-fashioned sling. You remember the one that David used? And it damaged my eye. So I go to the judge. I said, look, this guy damaged my eye. I'm going to damage his. The man pleads. He said, look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. It was an accident. Forgive me. I said, no, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what the law says. So he said, look, I will compensate you. I'll give you a kid from the flock. I'll give you a heifer. Forgive me. I said, no, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He has a right. That's the law. This is what Jesus finds among his people. They're going for the letter of the law and they're forgetting the spirit. So as a spiritual physician, he prescribed the remedy for the hard-heartedness, for going for the letter of the law and forgetting the spirit. He says, no, you must forgive, man. You must forgive. So how many times, Lord? So he says, 70 times 7. It means indefinitely. It's not to, to be taken literally. 70 times 7 means 490. You don't start counting. Look, this is the fifth time now. Huh? This is the 50th time now you have wronged me. This is... 450 times. No, we don't do that. In other words, indefinitely. Who's going to start counting 490, 749, 490? 
No. Forgive, forgive. Turn the other cheek. Beautiful, beautiful teaching for a certain sickness. You don't want to forgive. You don't want to forgive. He says, forgive and forgive. If a fellow strikes you in the right cheek, give him the other. If a man makes you walk one mile, walk with him too. If a man takes away your coat, give him your cloak also. Agree with thine adversary quickly, said Jesus, while thou art with him on the way, before he takes you before the magistrate and makes you depart with your last father. Beautiful teaching. For a sickness. If you haven't got that sickness, it's suicide. For the sickness, beautiful remedy. It is not as a tonic, it's not as a panacea. I have been telling my British people. You see, they have been ruling my, my people for over a hundred years. So when I go there, I says, you know, you are good Christians. You know what you have to have done? When Hitler wanted to invade Britain, you good Christians. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Jesus said, if a man takes your coat, give him your cloak also. So your coat, cloak, coat is your country and your cloak is your empire. You should have welcomed Hitler and the army said, come, take, man, you can have the empire as well. You can have Britain and you can have our empire as well. Take it. Good Christians. Why didn't you do it? So no, it's unnatural. It's unnatural. What you did was natural. You have to defend your person and your position. And to extend your hostilities to a reasonable amount of satisfaction and retaliation. In the state of nature, everyone has a right to do that. What you did was natural. It was Islamic. But it's against the teachings of Jesus. You are not a good Christian. You are a hypocrite. You say you're following Christ, but you're actually following Muhammad. This is the teaching of Muhammad, that you must defend yourself with whatever you have. Your teaching was, give in, give in. If a man makes you to walk one mile, walk two. How? So, you see, this is a remedy for a sickness. His teaching was, as he says himself, Jesus Christ, he is telling his people, the Jews, that he has come for the Jews. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I have only come for the Jews. That is what he says. The remedy is for the Jews, for their sickness, not for yours. I would be happy if the European world will practice what Jesus told them. Practice that. Turn the other cheek. Give your coat and your cloak also. Come, I want to see you do that. I want to see who does that. Which guy? Which Christian? Where? Impractical, suicidal, but preaching sounds beautiful. You know, love, turning the chi. Where is that hypocrite who does that? There isn't. So the teaching, each prophet, according to the needs of his people, he prescribed a remedy. And in that system of religion, Islam is the culminating point. Among the Semitic religions, Islam is the fulfillment of the teachings of Moses and Jesus. It is the same religion on different levels. It's not a different religion. If mankind creates variations, creates fruits, adornments, this is the nature of man. He is not satisfied with simple, straightforward instructions. This is man. He is complicating things himself. You see the Jews. If you read the Bible, you read there that prophets after prophets came to them, warning them that they must worship the one and only God that there is. They said, you must worship the Lord God, thy God, who is a jealous God. And he says that I shall have no graven images before me, not even the like of the likeness of the things on earth, or in the heavens above, or in the waters beneath the sea. For my name is jealous and I am a jealous God. I want nothing before me. You worship me and me alone, direct. I want nothing intermediary in between me and you. Come to me. After prophets after prophets, warnings after warnings, they made the golden calf. Then they, you hear about the golden calf? Yes, they made the golden calf. And we laugh. We laugh at the Jews. I said, the laugh is on all of us. We are all the same. All we are the same. We are given simple, straightforward instructions, but they're too simple for us. You know, we're too clever for those simple instructions. So we must find, make inventions. Like we read in the book of, of Ecclesiastes in the, in the Bible, it says, he the Lord had made men upright, but he had sought out many inventions. He has made you simple, straightforward, straight teaching. The Lord God is the one and only God that there is. 
but you must say, no, he's three in one. Multiplicity you create. You know, ideas you create. He's a, he's a spiritual being. He says, God is spirit, and that, that, those that worship him must worship him in, in truth and in spirit. Not in form, shape, or size. But we must have form, shape, and size. You say, without that, you can't worship him. He says, this is what I want. You say, no, I will give you that. This is man. Every man, every man is like that. I can't say that the Muslims are totally exempt from that sickness. We also have sicknesses. But this is the nature of man. We laugh at the Jew, but this is, the laugh is also on us. We are also in the same boat. So they made the golden calf. Jesus Christ comes and teaches his people, come, so I'll teach you how to pray. He said, pray like this, O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is the father of everybody. Means he is our Lord, cherisher, creator, sustainer, revolver of everybody. Metaphorically, he is the father of everybody. But we miss the mark. He said, come, I will teach you how to pray. O oh, our father. And when he taught them this, Judas was one of them. That the Lord God is the father of even Judas, the traitor. He is the father of everybody, the good and the bad. He is the father of everybody spiritually. He is everybody's father. Means he is everybody's creator. But you'll find groups and groups of people. They can't see that. This is the father of Jesus Christ. He called him Abba. Abba means father. That means he's his real father. But he's telling you and me, he says, call him Abba. You, you mean his father. In the Jewish language, there was nothing wrong with that. In Islam, it's forbidden. So we don't call him father. Not because it's a bad word. There's nothing wrong with the word father. But this word father has now got other connotations. Therefore, it's, it's eschewed in Islam. You know, it's an amazing situation that in the Holy Quran, we are given 99 attributes of God in this book. 99 attributes. Qualities of God. That He is. Ar-Rahman, he is Ar-Rahim. One of the verses of the Quran, surahs of the Quran says, He is Allah besides whom there is no other God. Al-Malik, the King, Al-Quddus, the Holy One, Al-Salam, the source of peace and perfection. Al-Mu'min, Al-Muhaymin, Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Matakabbir. Subhanallah, Allah yushirkun. Huwa Allahu Al-Khaliq, he is Khaliq, Al-Bari, Al-Musawwir. Beautiful, beautiful attribute. 99 attributes of God are given in this holy book. He is not 99 gods. These are his qualities. He is not, his quality is not to be taken out of him. And he says, now this is Rahman, this is Rahim God, this is Salam God, this is Quddus God, this is... No. No. God is Rahman, and He is Rahim, and He is Al Malik, and He is Quddus, and He is As Salam, He is Mumin, and He is Mohammed. All these are His qualities. He is not these different persons. These are His attributes. 99. But among these 99 attributes, you know, it's an amazing thing in this list that Father is not one of them. This is a miracle that this man. Muhammad, an illiterate man in the desert who didn't know how to read or write. He goes, we know this is given to him by inspiration. But mankind, the outsiders, they say Muhammad wrote the book. I said, all right, he wrote the book, for example. I agree with you. I said, all right, Muhammad wrote the book. So I said, he invented 99 attributes. If he wrote it, he invented them. I said, you've got to agree, he invented them. 99 attributes, he invented them. He said, yes. I said, now you, with all your professorship, you doctor, you lawyer, you professor, come on, you give me some attributes to God. Come on, come on, think, think. Give me attributes to God. Oh, he is the father in heaven. I say, ah, he is loving. He say, yes, he's kind. I say, yes, he's just. I say, yes, come on, come on. He's all knowing. I said, yes. He's omnipotent. I say, yes, come on, come on. You can't go beyond a dozen. You know that? The cleverest of you can't go beyond a dozen. <clears throat> With all your cleverness. Come on, give me. Invent them. 
This man in the desert, he invented 99. With the crowning glory, Allah. But I says, you know, in your list of that dozen, or half a dozen, the father would be foremost in that half a dozen. You know that? He's always dangling before you. Father in heaven, the father in heaven. God is love, God is love, God is love. He's, he's being dangled before you, so you'll repeat that. He's the father in heaven, I say, yeah. He's loving, I say, yeah. Come on, come on. Amazing. This word father is being dangled before him for 23 years, and he, went, he never bites it. Consciously or unconsciously, he never takes it. Why? It's a miracle. For 23 years, that word father, 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 father in there, and he's hearing about God, the father, he never takes it. And he goes on creating names as if from nowhere, from fresh air. Hmm? You believe that? He was getting them from fresh air. All these attributes, 99, and he crowned it with the word Allah. There's a beautiful necklace of pearls, 99 pearls, with the crowning pendant, Allah. But father is not one of them. And father is easier in Arabic than Rabb. Abb means father, and Rabb means Lord, cherisher, sustainer, evolver. He's again and again, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. All praises due to Allah, who is Rabb. He is the Rabb of Al Alameen. He is the Lord, cherisher, sustainer, evolver of the worlds. He is not Abdul Alameen. Ab is easier than Rabb, but Ab is a shoe. Why? Because people have a certain misunderstanding. The word by itself is good, beautiful. But it has now created other connotations. Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. So he is the father who begot Jesus. Begetting. So this is out. Allah does not beget. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. <coughs> And there's nothing like him to him. Anything you think or imagine is not him. So, it is the same religion. The teaching of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. Where new variations creep in, it is the duty of the man of God to clear, clear your thoughts, your understandings, your concept of God. God is one. He is indivisible. He is the one and only. In Judaism, the teaching of Moses, teaching of Jesus, teaching of Muhammad. There is no trinity in their teachings. This is again creation of man. But we will not go into all this. I would like to give you, since this is the first talk, I don't know really you know, what, what, thing, what aspirations you have, what you want to really know from me. Tomorrow night there is another talk on Christ in Islam here. And the night after tomorrow there is one on uh, Muhammad, as the, or the Prophet of Islam has foretold in the Bible. But uh, there might be a lot of other things that you might want to know. And it might also give an idea that tomorrow night whether I can fit that in or I can give you solutions to your problems now. And I would like to leave this meeting open for that purpose instead of carrying on, you know, endlessly, keeping you here for an hour or two. I think rather than that, I give you the opportunity of asking questions. On what I've dealt with, or if anything else beside, if it will be covered tomorrow, then I'll tell you so. But if I can help you now, I will help you now with your questions. So with these words, I say, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very, very grateful for this community in Geneva for creating this opportunity for me to share with you my thoughts on the subject uh, Christianity and Islam, or rather, as I said, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. وآخر الدعوان أن الحمد لله رب العالمين and I'm sure all of us have enjoyed the outspoken sincerity in every word brother that said now the time for questions and answers I would uh, kind request you to have one question at a time by one person at a time. It's always a question repeating itself between the Christian and the Muslim, the Christianity and Islam, that uh, we say always that the Islam is a whole system of life. 
and the Christianity, the Christian, they said, well, also our, we have our Ten Commandments and it's also a system of life. So I would like very much our brother Mr. Dida to explain us the difference between the Islamic system and the Christianity system. Thank you. As I was saying, you see, there is a relationship, there is a continuity, a continuation of, in the teachings. There's a relationship between the teaching of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. One is a complement to the other, a completion of the other. See, in the time of Jesus Christ, he came to prescribe for the sickness of the Jews. But in the process, this mighty messenger of God, as soon as he opened his mouth, you know, he estranged his people. His people were not happy with his preaching. And he was on the run, so to say. Every time he opened his mouth, the Jews somehow wanted to pick up stones to stone him. And he's running here, running there. A man who is on the run, he has not got the opportunity to give you the whole gamut of religion, to give you all the solutions to your problems. So he did say, before he parted, in the Gospel of St. John, in the Bible, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now, meaning you haven't got that capacity. He's got the knowledge, God has given him, that can cater for mankind's needs till doomsday, yawm al qiyamah. But the people to whom he was addressing, they were not fit to receive it. So he said, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. There's somebody coming after him, whom he describes as the spirit of truth. So when he is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Now we say, here it is. He's telling you that somebody else is to come after him to guide mankind into all truth. Means solve all the problems. Solution to all the problems. And we say that that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And I'll be dealing with that in detail in the third lecture. I hope you'll bear with me till then, you see. That will be part of the third lecture. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, you had something? Come. In your lecture, there was one particular point which uh, is uh, on which I want to make a question on, a clarification about. And that is that you mentioned that Islam is a culmination of the Semitic religions. As a Muslim, I always understood that Islam is a culmination of all religions, whether it is Semitic or other religions. Because in the Holy Quran itself, al Yom the concept is uh, this, that the entire, all the religions, they evolved eventually into Islam. How could you kindly sort of uh, clarify this point? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question was, if it's not properly taken in by the, uh, by the recorder there, the question was that I had said that Islam is the culmination of the teachings of Moses and Jesus. Whereas we believe, we Muslims, that Islam is the culmination of all religions. It's true. But now, since we were dealing with these three, I said, look, the world can be divided safely into two major groups of religions, Aryan and Semitic, and we left Aryan one side. I said, here is a relationship, you know, even a genetic relationship through ancestry, Father Abraham. We are all going back to Father Abraham. And as such, now there is a very close relationship in the belief in prophethood, in the belief of holy scriptures. All these things, we are so close so in that relationship, I was showing that Islam is the culmination of these. But, as you quoted rightly, the Quran says, al akmaltu lakum That this day I have perfected for you your religion. Wa atmamtu alaykum na'mati. And have completed my favors unto you. Wa raditu lakum al-Islam ad And have willed that Islam should be your religion. It is the culmination of all faiths, all religions. But since we are dealing with those three, I use it in that sense. Thank you. Uh, something that I hear, and I'm not sure of it. You said about the law, one eye for one eye, two for two. In Islam, it's so quick. 
and uh, we do not have prison. I want to know, is that right? That if we want to apply Islam in the modern life, we will have imputation, we will have uh, uh, cutting the head, do we, uh, are, are we going to finish the prison? And for example, if you want to say, it's very correct if you cut uh, a part of a man that the woman hasn't got it, how are you going to do something which would be equal? I'm sorry to give you a very rough example. It's quite enough. It's quite enough. You see, what I was telling you was that a law as given by God through Moses was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Was that from God? The Christians say yes, the Jews say yes. God gave such a law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. Where is it? It's in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus. So if you are a Jew... Like that. Sorry to interrupt yes, you. yes. It means if someone commits adultery, yes. we should have him stoned. But yes. if I am I'm Muslim, yes. I that. Yes. But if I have read correctly, yes. I think it is not possible to give his sentence to anyone <coughs> by any present Islamic ayatollah or greater than him. Because that man with that woman should be seen at the time of committing his adultery by four persons which are Thank you now. And I don't know, uh, it's another question, and probably I don't want to get Let's finish one at a time. We'll finish it. Give everybody a chance, and you can come back to your other questions. Yes. You see, I think you are jumping the gun. Look, we were talking about this was the law. Now, for adultery, for example, I said, the Old Testament, which the Jews and the Christians accept as the word of God, in it, they are told that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. So if you are a Jew, I said, look, that's your book. If you are a Christian, I said, that's your book. I'm a man. No, 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 no. I'm just giving an, an idea. Okay. You see? Now, with regards to adultery in Islam, that law is there that you need four witnesses. Okay. And if four persons testify that they saw the man and the woman committing adultery, and in their evidence, if they contradict one another, yeah. they will all get 80 lashes each. Okay. Right. So we would like to see which guy is prepared to come forward, even if he has seen it, to say, look, I saw. And the man and the woman who is so brazen, that four people can come along and watch you doing what you are doing like dogs and pigs, <laughs> and uh, you allow them to see you, you know, in a place, you want to go and do things like that, then you deserve what is going to come to you. But the law is so strict. How many people are stoned to death or punished for this? How many? I can't imagine. I think except for one in the early days of Islam, for 1400 years I can't imagine another man and a woman being stoned to death for adultery. Because it's so strict, it's right. Four witnesses. And the witnesses must tally in their evidence. And if they don't tally, they get 80 lashes. You don't just get off scot free. For, you know, what you're besmirching the character of the woman and the man. You deserve 80 lashes. And if you get 80 lashes and your brother gets 80 lashes, I'd like to see anybody else coming forward, even if he has seen it, to say, look, I saw. Give somebody else. The chairman had the chairman had said one question at a time per person. But you might not have heard it. Can you put off the no. uh, pretending, uh, I'm talking on behalf of my wife as well. So no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to ask you about this one only. No, so you, you will. You, let's stand by principles. No principles. Yes. Give somebody else a chance, and somebody else is it? Then we come back to you. You will have your chance. Thanks a lot. Yes. So you, you know, have. have a, yeah. So you also have a chance to. No. You have a breather, you'll have a time to think also. Yes, who's the next one? Thank you very much for that. I'd like to put one question to you. Something very basic that I think a lot of people would like to have some verification on. You know, most Christians, Christians as a whole, they believe that salvation only comes through the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Since Christ has 
we know as an example, that it's in the Bible that he was a Jew and he originally was brought up, educated by a Jewish family, and ever, he was, in every essence, he was a Jewish man, Jewish God. And since in my reading of the Bible, also, I don't find any evidence of the Christian idea of salvation, that salvation only comes through the, the blood of Jesus Christ. How does the idea of salvation relate the Christian idea of salvation, which is connected directly with the crucifixion of Christ? How does it re relate to the Jewish idea of salvation and to the Muslim idea of salvation? How do they three uh, correlate? How are they correlated? You to see, the, the, the Jewish and the Christian uh, the Jewish and the Muslim idea about coming right with God is believe in God and do good deeds. You have to pay for your sins. Anybody? Everybody. You pay for your own sins. Nobody pays for you. You take the bitter medicine yourself. If you are sick, you take the medicine. If you've got a rotten appendix, you be operated. Not somebody else because he's his whole. This is the law of God for all eternity. And it doesn't change. The law of God doesn't change. That you are personally responsible for your action. In the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, God speaks. He says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Anybody who commits a crime, sins, he shall perish. Like this, we all die. But meaning spiritually, he will be cut off. The one that sins, the soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Son means we are the children. Father, Adam, he committed a mistake. And we, his children, are not responsible for what happened to him, what he did. He pays for his, you pay for yours. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Whatever his children are doing today, sons of Adam, like last June, 300,000 sodomites, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage, led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. God will not ask Adam, look at your children. See what they're doing, rubbish. No, no. Poor Adam, he will be saved from that. See? Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the, iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Meaning, whatever the good thing the good man does, he will get his fruits, rewards. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever the evil man does, he will have to pay the price. But if the wicked, this is the way of salvation, but if the wicked will turn from all the sin that he has committed, means repent, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is salvation in Judaism, that is salvation in Islam, and also in the teaching of Christ. But if the followers, they choose, an easy way, that is their business. But it is not the teaching of Christ. Jesus Christ, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, most certainly I am telling you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. And I am asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? Got to keep the laws and the commandments, believe in God, and do good deeds. James, in the book in the New Testament, says, faith without action is dead. What is the proof of your faith that you believe? Your actions. How do I know that you believe? Your actions. Like this, you can claim anything. I can say anything. You can say anything. What is the proof? Actions. Faith without action is dead. But there are people, missionaries, preachers, like Jimmy Swaggart, this man, Jimmy Swaggart, Oh, you see this poster is there, James Swaggart. I had a debate with him. He has written some more than 30 books. Like this. The Error of the Jesus Only Doctrine. Roman Catholicism. The Preacher. Pornography. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Incest. Homosexuality. Alcohol. He's written more than 30 books. Now he says that you don't have to do good deeds. To earn him. This is Christ paid the price. And there are a lot of preachers now they talk like You don't have to do anything to get heaven. You just believe that Christ died for your sins and salvation is yours. Because he says, if you have to do good deeds with that belief, he said the good that sacrifice was redundant. You he paid the full price. Now you're going to do this, I'm going to pray five times a day, I'm going to fast, I'm going to abstain from dancing and drinking. So that will not save you. 
What is going to save you is that you believe that Christ died for your sins, He paid the full price, you don't have to do anything. But He says, good work will come by itself. They will come by itself, He says. Then He cries, He says, there are 11 million drunkards. They call them problem drinkers in America. 11 million drunkards. You know? They call them problem drinkers. They don't call them drunkards. They say they are problem drinkers. And He says, there are 50, 44 million heavy drinkers in America. And he said, I make no distinction between the two. To me, they are the same. That means 55 million drunkards, according to Jimmy Swagger. 55 million. Where is this? This belief of yours. See? Then he talks about the preachers, the people who are preaching. They themselves, the preachers. This is a book called The Preacher. He talks about the preachers. He's a preacher himself, but he's talking about the other preachers. He says, you know the preacher says, I went to the bank, some business, on some business, to the manager. Maybe you wanted an overdraft. So the manager is, knowing he's a preacher, he says, you know who are the worst payers? He says, no. He says, three P's, P, P, P. He says, preachers, painters, and prostitutes. They are the worst payers. This is in his book, The Preacher. Look, I don't know, if some Christian bookshop you'll be able to buy here, I don't know. Three P's, you know, P, P, P. You haven't got it in Arabic, you can say B, B, B. It's P, P, P. You know, preachers, painters, and prostitutes. So, Swagat says, Swagat says, he said, I don't know about the painters and the prostitutes, but I do know about the preachers, that it is true. So, what is this? You know, they die for your sins, he says, look, it's not changing your life. You've got to act. Your actions will prove your faith. This is just talking, you know, we are living in another world. I sin no more. This is the man tells you, I sin no more. He said, the spirit permeates in me. I've got the spirit. He said, permeates the whole of your being. There's no way in empty space, he says, no. Spirit must fill everything, every molecule of yours. It fills up. So I said, there's no place for the devil. He says, no, there's no place for the devil. I said, you can't be tempted. He says, no. He's consistent. You see, if the spirit permeates you, there's no place for the devil, then you can't be tempted. He says, no. Then I said, you are greater than your own Lord Jesus. You know, Jesus was tempted by the devil. You remember? This is taken up to a high mountain, you know, showing the kingdom of the world. He said, come on, you worship me and I'll make you master. He was tempted by the devil. And you can't be tempted until you're greater than your own God. Congratulations. He said, no, 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 I can't be tempted. I said, then the spirit is not in you. I don't. No, no, this is the type of just talk. Empty talk. Faith without action is dead. In Islam, in Judaism, and in the teaching of Christ. You have to prove your faith by your action. I, uh, if you stand up, I think they can picture you. Yes. I just wanted to correct you at one point and then answer your second question. Yes. First of all, there were six million Jews that died in World War II. And they died because they didn't want to believe that they were being prosecuted by their own kind, prosecuting me by their own nationality. When Hitler during 42, when Hitler during 37, after he came to power in 34, 33, he started with his purge. He started to eliminate the Jews, but the Jews did not want to believe that their own kind were eliminating them. Therefore, they died because of that. That that is a fact, and I want to correct it. It's not a possibility, but it's a fact. The second point I want to ask is that uh, in Judith, I was adopted by Jewish parents, but I'm Muslim. I'm Arab Muslim. Uh, when the Jew Jewish faith consider father, when they consider Moses as father, they're speaking of Moses as a guidance. And I think in Islam also for the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad, many people look up to Muhammad as a father, but they look up to God as the ultimate. Muhammad is directed the individual as Moses directs the tribe, the Israeli the Israeli tribes. And I want to my point is, uh, there's a difference between two fathers. There's a father who gives birth to his own child, and there's a father God, and then there's another father. There's three types. You can 
definition of father is another father who leads the individual, who leads the, the child from birth, or leads the individual that needs guidance. And I think that should be clarified. I'm sorry, but I don't think you clarified the point enough. I, was, I respect your program, and I think you, you're an excellent lecturer, but I would like you to clarify that point for me on father. And what the question? Uh, yeah, not really. You see, I don't know whether I'm going to fumble with this. Uh, you see, people call him Moses' father, uh, call him Muhammad's father. I don't know. I didn't hear anybody call him Muhammad's father. I didn't at any time. Nor did I hear in my environment anybody call him father. But father in the sense that, you know, he is showed us the way and all that, but he's not being used. We say he's Rasulullah, he's the messenger of God, you know, Habibullah, Habibullah, all that, but not, we don't call him Abba. No, you know, Abu. I don't know. I, I, do, I have a dream. You see, this father. I'm not talking about the Muslim religion, I'm talking about the Jewish religion. The Jewish religion, the way you criticize the, the term father, which I don't accept, I'd like to clarify that in the Jewish terminology for me, or in the terminology of what father means, because in my terminology, and from what I've grown up and studied, Father mean for me, father is a guidance. Father does not normally mean the father that gave me birth okay, okay. or God. Father also means an individual that guide me in right, the proper direction. Right. But you see, yes, father, father. you see, since this term has created certain mischief, it has created certain mischief and it's creating ideas in people's minds that God Almighty physically got Jesus. Jesus is the only begotten son. Have you heard that before? All the time. Right. So if he's begotten, Begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. Now, when you use terms like that, you see the term, I said, look, maybe you didn't mean that. But the, by the, the way you're using the term now, it creates so many people in the back, in the, in the third world, they're taking these things literally. So to save you from falling into the pit, in Islam you are saying, he says, don't call him father, call him Rabb, don't call him Abba. Like this word, I was talking about those Sodomites in San Francisco just now. You remember? Yes. You call them gays. You call them gay. It's a beautiful word. Gay. You know? Yes. In my life, you see, when I went to school, I was learning a poem. They taught me at school. All the children were learning together. So gentle lords and ladies, gay on the mountain down the day. You know, gay. He's happy and gay. And everybody, beautiful word, gay, happy and gay. And I'm carrying on, I'm growing up, growing up. And now I'm maybe about 20, 25, maybe around about 30. I'm reading the newspapers talking about gay. And I'm puzzled. What is this gay? Is it gay? What? You know, some, something fishy there, you know, that I think was gay. But what I knew about gay was happy and you know, joyous. <laughs> ladies were gay and gentlemen were gay. Lords and ladies, they're all gay. You know, I mean, very happy and joyous. So now this beautiful world, you perverted it. So I can't call you anymore, happy and gay. <laughs> Immediately you react, so what the hell, what do you mean? I said, no, no. <laughs> Look at the dictionary, man, what does it say? Gay, very happy fellow, jolly old fellow. No, he said, to, please, stop it. I don't want you to call me gay. <laughs> so, you see, the beautiful words, simple words, good words are being now perverted, prostituted. So once he's done that, he said, yes, true. Yes, true. There are so many other words like that. You know, once they acquire other meanings, secondary meanings, and it becomes obnoxious, <laughs> you throw them away. In the origin, comrade. You know, comrade is a very good word. Comrade, it's friend, like a companion. You use that in America, you go to jail. <laughs> you know, they for a comrade. <laughs> What's wrong with the word comrade? So you look at the dictionary. Nothing wrong with it. But as soon as you use it, comrade, comrade did that. This guy must be a communist. <laughs> taken up by the CIA for question. <laughs> so why do that to me? <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with the word. I said there's nothing wrong, wrong with the word father. But now it has acquired other connotations. God knows that this is how now your minds, how they're going to start to stop it. Don't use that word for father. Yes, yes, my friend. Yes. Uh, Islam. If Islam can be divided uh, 
the total submission to God's will. And for that matter, anybody uh, who can totally submit to, uh, to God's will can be called a Muslim. Then can I know uh, some of the things which one does and will make him call the Muslim? I don't know whether I will make myself. I think uh, what you are trying to say is that what makes a man to be a Muslim? Sure. Thank you. To be a Muslim, we say you have to believe that there is but one God. You have to recite the formula, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul. Which means literally that there is, there is no other object of worship but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So if you believe in one and only God and Muhammad is his messenger, then Muhammad explains to you what Allah is like. That he's not like a man, he's not like a monkey, he's not like an elephant, he's not like a snake, he's not three in one, he's not two in one, he's, there's no multiplicity, he's not, he's an, not anthropomorphic out of human pattern or any other pattern. He gives you what? So whatever he tells you, now you listen because he's a messenger of God. He says don't drink alcohol in total, as true it is alive. He says, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity, it's alright. Whatever he tells you, you do. You believe that there is God and he is his messenger. So whatever he tells you is from God. You are a Muslim. He tells you to pray, you pray. How he tells you how to pray, you pray that. He tells you to fast, you fast. How he tells you how to fast, you fast. So whatever he tells you, you believe that there is but one God. And you believe that Muhammad is his messenger. So what? He tells you to believe in Jesus. So you believe in Jesus. Believe in all the prophets. I believe in all the prophets. Whatever he tells you, you believe. You are a Muslim. Whatever he told you, it's contained in the book. You say, I don't accept. You are not a Muslim. Even when I am. You can be drinking. It's against the teaching of Islam. They say, ah, you know, I joined that company and you know, I can't seem to let go. Uncle, pray for me. You are still a Muslim. What is that? This nonsense. You know, what, what does God is worried about me, whether I drink or I don't drink, whether I eat the pig or I don't eat, eat the pig. No? I don't believe in this nonsense, immediately you are out. No when you pray five times a day, and you give the and everything, you go for hajj, you are not a Muslim. Well, actually, you have already explained, which I understood, uh, and uh, I got a chance also to hear a lot of uh, scholars, and uh, that is not going to be repeated, that uh, Islam, is not uh, a starting point, that is the continuation, the series, the teaching of Islam from the very beginning. And the Quran is the completion of the teachings uh, revealed uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the prophet Muhammad sallallahu That's true, whatever you have explained, and that's very interesting, whatever this uh, was explained, for example, uh, alcohol is not allowed, and it is allowed, the ordinary, and a lot of things. But now, a lot of questions are uh, growing in the mind of the people. How to start? How to apply the question in the law of the God? And in the modern concept, why the people don't want to have most of the people, uh, unfortunately, oh, I don't want to understand the economy. I don't want to understand the global structure. And I don't want to be involved this just to know the revelation and uh, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's enough and I will have one thing. Unfortunately, which I, my impression may be, I will get a chance to uh, guidance. But this is not a question of my personal question, this is a confusion among the lot of the people, lot of people. For example, we are we have faced a lot of problems, the poverty, ignorance, around political systems. And unfortunately, so far, Muslim states implemented so ruthlessly. And I can, I can say, such a nonsense way, the law of Islam, for example, cutting the hands uh, for the ordinary, so called, that is called, uh, I mean, the, uh, punished by the stones, and so ruthlessly. But must be, uh, I think, uh, brother, you will explain that all these laws, in a particular context, in the pretext, under these conditions, People are supposed that, I mean, he is supposed to be, uh, you know, punished to cut his hands. So that is not explained one thing. Secondly, and the most difficult task, which is not propagated and is not taken initially, as compared with a lot of, for example, 
everybody knows Muslims don't drink. I mean, they are not supposed to drink alcohol, uh, not to eat meats, uh, the things like that. It's an important thing, for example, to know uh, how to apply to the laws of uh, the Quran, laws of Islam, uh, in the modern uh, you know, context, one thing. And secondly, not to tell, for example, the difficult task of our ulamaya. I am not talking about the ulamaya, because most in the history, but I am interested to know the very simple question for, for the people to understand. In the modern concept, how you are going to apply? While the people are not aware of the economic and social political structure of the system. That is my question. That can be a something practical, otherwise, just to enjoy having nice discussion and go out. That's what is your problem? You see, your problem at the moment is not that somebody stole your wife's handbag and you want to have her hands chopped off. It doesn't apply. It doesn't apply here. You don't need it. In other words, you're going to waste everybody's time discussing hypothetically, you know, there is no Islamic government here, that if there is a Islamic government, there is a jurisprudence, people who study the law, and under what circumstances, what will be applied, is not that, you know, somebody feels your pain, and it's a chop of his hands, somebody is a chop of his head, it doesn't work like that. You see, there are jurisprudence, they will sit down, if there's a government, if the government of Pakistan is acting upon it, find out from the jurisprudence. If a law is being acted upon in Iran, find out how they're working it. Here now you're asking me about jurisprudence. I am a, an expert in comparative religion. You ask me questions pertaining to that. Then you are honoring me and you will get the maximum out of me. You're going to ask me all these things now. This is what the Jews were doing to the Jesus Christ. You know, asking him questions, trying to trip him, trap him. This is what is your problem? You ask me now, look, the Christian was asking you, why don't you eat the pig? Then you ask me, Mr. man, I don't know how to answer that follow. How would you answer that? Islam teaches this five times a day. How can you pray five times a day? Tell me that. What is your problem? This is not your problem about chopping people's hands. Because I don't know how many people you have seen with chopped hands. In your life, if you have seen a single Muslim with his hands chopped off or steamed, have you seen one yet? I haven't. I'm 70 years old. I haven't seen one yet. So it's not a problem. Well, there's a problem that you talk about. I hope. How to implement them? That is when you establish a government. You know, you establish in Geneva, Islamic government in this country. <laughs> then I will come and help you. How to, how to implement that law. You make it a Muslim country. <laughs> That is not the subject about the second coming of Christ. I said, in his second coming, <clears throat> if you had the chance to ask him, you was in the context of what I was telling you, <coughs> oh Jesus, because only then you can ask him, otherwise it's too late on the other side. See? So when he comes along, he's come along, he's looking for his people, so you can ask him, what church you belong to, sir? What church, what, I, what religion you follow? So if he told you Christianity, then you ask him, you ask him, I will ask him. If he tells me Christianity, what church you belong to? That is hypothetical. In other words, it is nonsensical. Really. That you're going to ask this man of God, what is your religion? Because he can't say Christianity and Moses can't say Judaism. I was trying to prove that. Not about the second coming and what he's going to do and how he's going to do. That was not a part of the subject. This young man here has still got his question. Yes. I'll give it to him that mic, please. Look in that mic. Oh, oh, the lady has, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she's, she's got a question. Did you share? No. Do you have can, a question? Can you yes. share? No, you can't. Can? Give it to the young man. I see very right that uh, you don't want to explain, or as you said, you are a professor, and I do admire this, and I did get it. You don't want to go to the detail to say, if we do cut the hands, if we do get the prostitutes and stoning them, is that right or wrong? You don't want to enter in this subject. But very simply, I want to ask you one question 
on behalf of my wife. And this is something she is Swiss. And she was a bit uh, annoyed that you were attacking Western people that no white man has ever invited me for a tea. Could you please explain to me all these political asylums that they give us to Iranians, to communists, to Jewish, I don't know what, all these Americans, Swiss, British that you said they were helping, they were acting like Nazis, that I don't think it is, I mean, you, you know much more than me, but what I've heard, the British, they help the Jewish, and you are saying they acted the same. So I don't want to answer back the question that no, it is not only the Muslim world that they are the best, but my wife as a Muslim, she is Swiss, she has converted. She comes to you at the end of this conversation, please do excuse me, I don't want to put you on the edge. And she wants to shake hand with you. Will you do that? Yes. yes. You will. Thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You see, I think we, you see, it happens at times. Language, you no know, language. What I was trying to demonstrate was it's Swedish. Yes. You see, what I was trying to demonstrate was that in my country we are all color conscious. Why? Because of the law. I didn't say that you Swiss lady is a color conscious person, or this one or that. I didn't say that all the Europeans are like that. I said in my country, because the laws are based on color, everybody has it, including myself. If you remember, I said if I'm looking for a daughter-in-law, I was going to look for the lightest complexion one. Did I say that? So I said, look, the sickness is universal. We are cultivated, the sickness. Everybody talking color, color, color. So no and how good you are how simple you are, you also get contaminated. If not 100%, 5%. You still have that sickness. Because everybody is thinking in terms of color. I wasn't trying to say that there are no good people among the whites. They don't give you refuge to the Iranians, to the South Africans. They're running away from there. And you give them refuge here. You give them refuge in Britain. No, they're fantastic people. In South Africa also, they're very good people. But I said, as a whole now, Everybody is thinking in terms of color. And I didn't say that everybody here is sick in Geneva. I didn't say that. Oh, I suppose language is like that, you know, we're trying to say something and somebody else understands it. Uh, by the way, you know, I was thinking that the chairman might introduce this, or I might have done it myself. You see this poster is here. A great debate took place in America between Jimmy Swaggart, he's one of the mightiest Christian missionaries this century, Jimmy Swaggart and myself. And uh, that debate plus questions and answers were taken on video, professionally. And they are available. There are two tapes. One is a debate and one is a question and answer. And I brought them with me and thought in case people want them handy instead of writing to South Africa, uh, the information, information is given there. You can write and get it. But if you want them tonight and tomorrow night, if they are available, you can have them for 75 francs. 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 Right. Suspense. Suspense. 75 There's two for 75 francs. You can have them tonight if they are here, and tomorrow night if they are available. And in the meantime, if you there's, there's a, some certain office here, there's a book absolutely free of charge. You write for it to the address given, Islamic Propagation Centre in Durban, and the book plus a video list, in case you haven't got it, you can get it also free of charge from South Africa. Thank you very much, Brother Bidat, and thank you all, Brother Mr. for a wonderful evening. And uh, tomorrow night, in Great uh, Ola, will be the subject will be Christ in Islam. Christ in Islam, and I hope the questions will be prepared to the subject. And therefore, tomorrow, the same order, and the subject will be Muhammad in the Bible. Thank you. 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 Thank you.